I have the great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, the New South Wales Building Commissioner, Mr. David Chandler, OAM, who is affording us the time today to host this follow-up session on a seminar which we held, which we held on, in February 2021. David Chandler, OAM, was appointed New South Wales Building Commissioner in August 2019. After an impressive 40-year career in the Australian construction industry, in his capacity as New South Wales Building Commissioner, David is improving the quality of construction and restoring in the industry through leading the delivery of Construct New South Wales, a collaboration with the sector. Highlights of David's career include project management of some of Australia's most iconic developments, including Sydney's key apartments, as adjunct professor in the School of Computing, Engineering and Mathematics at Western Sydney University, David helped shape the next generation of construction professionals. David founded the Centre of Smart Modern Construction at Western Sydney University, which invests in new academic and research capabilities for the construction sector. He was the Deputy Chair of the BER Implementation Review and is a regular industry commentator and presenter. David was awarded an Order of Australia Medal for his services to the construction industry. I'd now like to ask Mr. Chandler to join us and present the topic on the role of financiers in restoring consumer confidence. I'm sure many developers and financiers would love to hear what he has to say. Over to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Peter, and thank all of you. And uh, let me also say that um, two years into this journey, I, I am indebted to the fact that uh, so many of you have reached out and so many of you are so committed to uh, getting this industry back to a place where it should be. So the last time I spoke with you, I think I probably hung up some headlines and started to show you the news that was shaming us all out of town. Um, I think we're having less and less of that these days. And frankly, I think uh, we're starting to get some good stories as opposed to ones that are the ones that we want to leave behind us. So I'm indebted to all of you because I'm now starting to go onto projects where I'm starting to see green shoots. Green shoots starting to represent the fact that everybody is very focused on how we can make this industry as good as it possibly can be. Uh, still some disappointments, and I'm afraid those people will, will find that uh, that's something that they'll have to deal with. But I've got to say, just I came off one project this morning. Um, it was a high court project at uh, Lane Cove. And I've got to say that um, yeah, there were a few things there that will need attention, but you know, I'm starting to see things that start to restore my confidence that this industry can do good work again and again. And it's not just that project. Uh, th there's an increasing number of them where the enthusiasm to show me the changes that people are making, their commitment to do things better, their willingness to fix things that need to be fixed. Um, I've got to say to you that that's really starting to make the back end of this reform program uh, a lot more pleasing than it's been at the front end. So we're now turning our mind to the fact that we've signaled that we would like everybody to have a rating by March next year. This is really the bit that brings all of this home. And that is that we want consumers to have a choice to be able to deal with a rated player. Now, we don't want to provide that rating ourselves. We want the market to provide that rating. And so today I'm going to talk to you a bit about that. And I'm going to talk to you about the fact that we do need the financiers to become part of what we're trying to do here because they're an, they're an essential part. They actually loan the developers the money for the projects. They then provide the drawdowns for that. And on a couple of occasions recently, of course, I've had to run into some developers, uh, some financiers and say, well, I think you could have paid more attention to this particular development than you have. So we've started to sort of bring this home with a view that everybody's got a role to play. And this is about financiers. So let me just move, ask you to move forward with these slides. Uh, if you move to the next one, which would be great. I uh, just want to give you a quick snapshot of where we've been because, um, you know, when we started this journey, these things looked very, um, very theoretical and very, um, in a way, they were they were ideas that were put up and said, oh yeah, that's fascinating, but what's that mean? Well, we did have to make the case that it was much more than regulation. Uh, it was much more about getting the built industry's capability back, 
starting to get people to understand standards, starting to understand how the supply chain comes together, because buildings are all these things stitched together. They're not just these things on their own. So look, this slide is just a, a, a snapshot. We started with that conversation back in August 2019. We, we talked about a, a, a way that we were going to uh, move in resetting the scales. And you'll see on the top right-hand slide of this slide, a circle which says, bring the insurers back into this industry. And that's what we're well advanced. We are well advanced in New South Wales of bringing the insurers back into this industry. And we'll have some very, very big news next week. The minister will announce uh, the, uh, the formation of a working group to stand up a product for 10 year warranty insurance. So that not only can we build better buildings, but we can say to the customers, these buildings have also got a warranty that comes with them from day one. So none of this business of having to worry about what might happen, we want them back. So that will be an announcement next week. I can tell you that in the bottom left-hand corner, we have made substantial strides in getting the regulator, Fair Trading, to shift its resources from applying itself two and three years after jobs have been finished to actually shifting those resources to the front. So that's why you're seeing us at occupation certificate audits. That's why you're going to see us in designers' offices starting in a few weeks starting to audit the drawings that are being loaded up to the e-planning portal. You're going to be seeing a much more front of the bus type uh, organization than you've ever seen in the past. And I can see this happening really rapidly every single day that we now move forward. So it's taken us a while to build this momentum, but we've got the momentum rolling. So in the bottom right hand corner is just a quick summary of the Construct New South Wales strategy not 24 or 45 recommendations, just simply six pillars, building strong foundations, legislation, risk ratings, industry capability building, contracts and transactions, a digital economy, and making sure that everything we do, we inform by research. So next week or the week after, you will also see us uh, release a survey uh, that we've done in conjunction with the uh, Strata Communities Australia, SCA. That's all your strata managers. Uh, we've got 500 completed surveys back for buildings that are up to six years old. And it's got very important data, evidence, research that will allow us all to make some decisions about going forward. But one of the things that's really interesting that we can now see is that that survey was finished in March. And in March, the most predominant defect that was present in buildings was in wet areas. As far, we're now in September and we're now seeing on the OC audits that in fact, the big ticket item is no longer wet areas. I think we've really started to turn wet areas around big time. So we'll, we're now focusing on fire and fire rating. That's the next big area that we'll focus on, followed by structure. There are still too many issues in structure, but I can tell you, you've all been listening. It's almost, it's amazing to go on jobs and people come and say, Commissioner, I want you to come and have a look at our wet areas. This is what we're doing. We don't do that anymore. We do it this way. It's a credit to all of you, the way that you're actually embracing uh, this movement. So look, I just the next slide just simply is a quick snapshot to remind you, it's no good going on these journeys if you don't know what it looks like when you get there. So, by the middle of next year, we want to make it quite clear that every other state in Australia and the consumers believe that New South Wales is the best place in Australia to buy an apartment. We've got nearly 100,000 apartments approved to commence development in this state now. What we now need to do is to get the deposits back. None of this is going to turn around. We're not going to get this economy right unless we get the deposits. So we've got to make sure the customers are saying, we think it's safe to go back in the water. And I'm hearing stories now that that's what they think. We want to make sure that New South Wales is the preferred place for financiers, not only to fund new projects, but to invest in supporting purchases of projects. I'm starting to get positive messages back from the banks that they're seeing those changes. I want New South Wales to be the most insurable state to build buildings and then to ensure the buildings 
when they've been built. I can tell you that we are leading in terms of the commentary that's been provided of the Assurance Council of Australia. They think New South Wales is the standout state in terms of solving these insurance risks. So this work that we've all been doing together is now starting to come together and we can put a bow around it. So the next big piece is this ratings that we're talking about. And you've all been hearing a lot about it over the last year. Well, we're serious. From the 1st of March next year, I will be messaging to consumers in New South Wales that if I was buying an apartment in New South Wales, I would only buy an apartment off a rated developer. I would not be buying an apartment off an unrated developer. So consumers from the 1st of March next year will have a choice. Deal with somebody who's rated, three stars, four stars, five stars, all fine by me. You don't get five stars overnight. So as long as you've got three, I will be saying to consumers, three stars, you, you're the, a person people should doing business with. So that's going to be a very strong messaging from March next year. And I urge you, I really plead with you, get rated because I am going to be making that call out to the market. And I don't mince my words when I make these sorts of statements. So then what we've got to do is to count the first 20,000 apartment deposits back. The goal that I want to see by the end of next year is that we've got 20,000 new deposits in from people who want to come back into the market. Now, if it's 25 or more, I'm really pleased about it. But what I'd rather do is under-promise and over-deliver. So we've got to get those 20,000 deposits back in the market ASAP. And then what we've got to do is to start making sure that the brand of what we've got this industry standing for is, in fact, something that's going to attract tomorrow's constructors. Because, you know, there's some really great young people out there, but we need more. I'm seeing some really, really good people. People are back hiring cadets. That's fantastic. I'm speaking to the universities. Universities are telling me that they've got developers ringing up saying, can we get some people with these skills? Can you add that course to your program? You are telling the universities what you want now, and that's the way we need it to be. So please make sure that you're open door with universities and we're gonna to get tomorrow's professionals really pointed at our industry. So look, the next slide really just is a quick report back to you of the changes that have happened since we've started the reforms in New South Wales. Now, when I came on board, these things were criticised as being the cancer of the industry. Now, none of these things are the cancer of the industry. Off the plan apartment purchases, is the way that housing is supplied in the multi-unit space in Australia. We have added to making sure that can be an attractive proposition, the powers of the Residential Apartment Buildings Act. So we say to people <clears throat> who want to criticise off the plan sales, saying you're dreaming, the way that we get a housing supply in New South Wales is off the plan apartment sales, that's not changing get used to it, but we will do what we need to do to make sure you can feel confident buying those apartments. So these are what we call the givens that we're saying to people, stop throwing rocks at these things. These things are the reality. So the second reality that we can now speak about is the use of SPVs, all a legitimate process to put a project together. But like all things, SPVs in the right hands are a good thing. SPVs in the bad hands are not a good thing. So that's why we're in introducing the ratings tools. Because the moment that you've got SPVs using ratings, then you can see the good SPVs and those that are not so good won't get a rating. So that's the positive step we've taken because we've wanted to make sure that we are not embarrassed about the fact that SPVs are the legitimate and most appropriate way to actually put projects together. Private certifiers, again, there were rocks being thrown at private certifiers. Those rocks have stopped, mostly. There's a couple of old hangarounds who like to just throw rocks because they've got nothing else to do. But I think we've changed the compass. If 
developers out there at the moment are telling me that they're committed to hiring the better certifiers. I'm hearing from the certifiers that they're now getting much more respectful engagements from developers and it's much clearer that their role is more respected. So the Building and Development Certifiers Act was formalized in September, uh, sorry, in July last year. I've got to say to you that I am blown away by the change of attitude of certifiers and the change of trust and work that I can see by certifiers going on out there. We've still got a couple of bad lemons. There's about 11 of them that we've got our eye on. I can't tell you who they are, but you know who they would be. And, and it's important that we deal with those people and deal with them very firmly because right today, those 11 certifiers are currently the PCA on 58 projects. So those 58 projects are going to get a lot of attention till they're finished because I'm not having those 11 certifiers undo the work that we've been doing in the last two years. A lot of criticism has been made of design and construct contracts. Now, again, design and construct contracts are going to be 60 to 80% of the way most projects are organized. Nothing wrong with design and construct contracts in the right hands, they're a good thing. In the wrong hands, they're not a good thing. What we've done there is we've introduced the Design and Building Practitioners Act. And I can see now that most people are well advanced in adopting the Design and Building Practitioners Act. I can see it through the questions that are coming. And we're also dealing with the feedback that we're getting from the industry. So for example, we got feedback that we've created an unintended uh, problem with the staging uh, of CCs. And you'll know that the regulations were amended to actually take the 12 month sunset that we had on, uh, C, uh, on stage CCs and push that out for three years. And that won't be reviewed for another three years. But that's a direct response to the feedback that you've been giving us in making sure that this stuff works as much for you as it does for us. And then finally, there's been a fair bit of criticism about the way that strata management works. I'm not going to go into that now in great detail, just to say that over the next year, there will be a review and amendments to the Strata Titles Act, and we'll clean up some of the things there that need to be cleaned up. Um, so look, we've, we're telling the marketplace, these are the things that are the, are the realities, they're unavoidable. But working with industry, we're going to make each one of those things come together and rebuild the confidence of this industry. So on the next slide, <clears throat> you'll see that I spoke to this at the last time we met, and I just wanna make sure that nobody forgets this. We have pivoted the way that the regulator looks at projects, and we now look at them through the eyes of the developer first, the designers second, the contractors and the certifiers. The developer appoints those people. The developer appoints the designers, appoints the contractors and appoints the certifiers. You can make good choices and you can make bad choices. They're your choices. De developers take deposits of customers. And at the end of the day, developers settle with those customers and then those customers end up owning those projects. So you'll see that we spend most of our time these days applying our regulatory effort there. So the RAB Act is going to be a big feature here. The Design and Building Practitioners Act is going to be a big feature here. And so is the Building and Developers Certifiers Act. All of these things are very focused at that absolute top level of the transaction. So when I hear people tell me I can't get a bricklayer, they don't make good bricklayers anymore. Well, I say, well, if you paid for bad brickwork, that's your problem, but that won't be the consumer's problem. So for some of you have seen some of those pictures on the project I posted at Mona Vale a few weeks ago, um, nobody can believe that anybody would accept and pay for brickwork or block work that looks like that. I'm certainly not going to let that happen while I'm building commissioner. And I think that most people are pretty ashamed by that sort of exhibit. So look, that's not happening a lot, but where we do find it, we're going to deal with it. And I've got to say to you that the other thing you've all got to give some attention to is cracks in slabs. I can't get over 
how badly the basement slabs of buildings are cracking. Now, it's okay to find an engineer that says, oh, that's normal or whatever. Cracks like we're seeing are not normal. Now, I've been into two buildings, one yesterday, one today. And while I was driving back to the office, I thought, you know, if you put all of the cracks that I saw together in the two, only two buildings that I looked at yesterday and today, I think all of those cracks, if you join them up end to end, would be enough to get you across the Harbour Bridge. So I just put it to you guys, much more attention required to that. Quickly, the next slide simply says, this is what I think the landscape's got to look like by the end of next year. We want to have 60 to 80% of players rated, and we want them publishing those ratings on their sales material. We want the consumers to be able to see that material and those ratings. Now, we see that the product that we've got to achieve here is how many developers and how many builders, trusted developers and trusted builders does New South Wales need to build 30,000 apartments year on year? Well, the advice I've got back from the industry is we need about 150 good quality developers and 150 good quality builders. And we need them right across the spectrum. So we need them for people who do 20 or 50 apartments a year, average 100 apartments a year, and at the big end, 750 or more. Across that full spectrum, because we don't want an industry that is just dominated by big players, but we've always got to have good new people coming into the industry. We think we need about 150 developers and 150 builders. And frankly, if they're not trustworthy, we do not need them. We just need those numbers of people or people like that because we don't need the bad guys. So on the next slide, I just want you to understand, I think many of you have seen this, but um, this is where we've now got to in terms of the way that fair trading is allocating its resources. So on the right-hand side, what you'll see is that that's where the market ratings are. That's where the independent ratings that we're asking you all to get. These are the ones that allow you to publish whether you've got three, four or five stars. And certainly don't be ashamed of three or four. Five's good if you get it eventually, but you don't have to be there on day one. So please do not be embarrassed about three stars. Be embarrassed about one or two. So that work focuses on the character, the capability and the capital adequacy of the businesses that are being rated. Now, we reckon that 60% of the builders and developers are largely in that space once they've got their ratings. So for the regulator of the future, we think there's 20 to 40% of people that we've got to focus our time on. So these are the people that we're going to be in their face more often than they would like us to be. And here we have a slightly different ratings approach where we're looking at the character, the motivation, and the opportunities that are out there for those people to achieve the things that they want to achieve if we don't get in their way. So you'll find that we've got many, many more resources to put at that sort of work, as opposed to not having any resources applied to where we can see market ratings. So we want to get out of everybody's face as best as we possibly can. So on the next slide, it just simply reinforces this issue that where we, we want to have ratings of the SPVs. So what we're seeing out there at the moment is on the front fence, it's got, this is a development by Dream Build Group and the SPV is Dream Build Development Company, SPV1. We want that SPV1 rated. We don't want Dream Build Group rated. We want the SPV rated because that's what the consumer buys when they receive that wad of paper, which is their contract, that's who is the person named on that contract. So we want that person rated. And that's what we're looking for from the 1st of March next year is that everybody's publishing that rating for each SPV on their sales brochure. Then we've got a situation where those people that have got that, they can be able to say to the purchasers, well, you've got a choice. You can deal with me, I'm rated or you can go across the road and deal with somebody else who's not rated, but you are in your own hands if you make that decision. 
you will hear pretty well all of my messaging between now and March next year will be on that subject alone. So financiers, next slide. Um, we think we've set up a landscape going forward where they can distinguish between the risky and the trusted players. And um, I talk to the banks very regularly because I've got to have a good relationship with the banks because from time to time when, they need, when they've got a, a tacky project or a difficult situation to deal with, they need to feel free to ring me and say, David, we've got a problem on this job. Can you give us some sort of guidance as to how we might go forward? So I'm dealing with receiver managers. I'm dealing with banks. The door is open because I don't want banks feeling as though this is a, a, another bash up of banks. It's not that at all. But as we move towards the back end of next year, I'll be less inclined to be helpful to banks that don't start to buy into this fact of you deal with the trusted players and you deal with the risky players at your own risk. But please don't come and see me about the fact that you dealt with a risky player and the wheels fell off. Not my problem. So what we want them to do then is to focus on the branded players, those branded rated players who prepared to say, I've got three stars, deal with me. They're the people that I want consumers dealing, doing business with. And then the message to the banks then is that I want you to make sure that you don't go to sleep once you've issued the loan. Uh, so many banks have just simply gone to sleep after they've issued the loan and they've paid no real attention to the developer drawdowns or the builder's drawdowns of the developers. This is not a set and forget. You know, when you're financing projects that are worth 20, 30, a billion dollars, the banks should be much more interested in, are there risks coming out of this project that need to be observed? So those risks are, what's the organizational governance? What's, are there conflicted players between the developer and the builder? Because organizational governance, we, we, we engage cause, to go and have a look at 10 projects that we've done OC audits on. And we can see a real correlation between where you've got the same director as the developer and the same director as the builder, then you don't have really good organizational governance. And there was a correlation between those projects and uh, building works rectification orders or delays to the, pro the issue of the occupation certificate. They should pay attention to the D and C contracts. They should make sure that the people who are doing those contracts are competent to do them. My observation at the moment is that only 50% of the people out there doing develop, uh, D and C contracts right now <coughs> have the capabilities to do them. There's a lot of work to build back D and C capabilities. So if you want to use D and C, fine by me, just make sure the people you've got doing it know what they're doing. Fine. The next point then is payment for non-compliant work. I was on a job yesterday and there was a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of defects that had to be fixed on this job, in my opinion. And the superintendent's there from the client. And I said, mate, have you been authorizing the progress payments for all of this work? Oh yeah. And I said, well, how are you going to get it done? He said, oh, that's what I've got retentions for. I say, no, retentions, mate, are about the contractor completing the project. They're not as a, a scheme to accommodate def defects and payments for defects because defects don't get fixed. They get covered over. So I've, I ripped into this uh, project manager superintendent yesterday. Honestly, I reckon he had nothing between his ears, but he certainly had the, the noise of my um, conversation with him rattling after I left. The cost of remediation is huge. You'll see on that little post I put up last week where just that little bit that cost $10,000 to make the first time, I reckon they save $500 in making it. It's gonna take them $5,000 to pull it apart and put it back properly. The cost of remediation or rework is out of control for those people who don't know what that means. You know, there are some developers out there now that they've actually collect the data and they know how much it costs them in defects after they've finished the building. 
And there are many developers out there that now tell me that those costs are less than $1,000 an apartment. I mean, that's an amazing outcome that those developers can say confidently across our entire portfolio of projects, then we need to make sure that we get these trailing costs of remediation down because the legacy costs to consumers are still high. The legacy costs are still a bit of a shocker for some projects. And I'll be publishing some case studies on some of those projects in the next six months, just so nobody forgets the fact that if you leave these legacy defects in these buildings, just what it costs consumers, it is substantial. So my job in the next year is to focus on what can we do about the legacy costs that are still in buildings that have been built. So you'll hear more about that going forward. Now, I only plan to, to stop there <clears throat> and take questions and answers. There's a couple of slides that are at the back end of this that I'm not gonna go into. Uh, so if you just move to the next slide, um, that sort of brings you to the end of my formal presentation. The slides that are in your pack, which will be shared with you, uh, in addition, you, you can have a look at them. And if you've got questions, feed them back through uh, the association and let's see if we can clarify those for you. Um, in, the, um, in that slide there are links to some pieces that should be of interest to you. Um, so that's just a, a communications and easy link page. So Peter, I'm up for questions. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I guess. <coughs> uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Perfect. How are you? Uh, th thank you for that presentation, Commissioner. So uh, as you can probably see, uh, ratings are interesting. I can see that uh, the industry is moving towards a rating system in order to basically assess uh, developers and builders and the ones that are doing things right. I think the one, one of the questions that's come through is that new players have an uphill battle from the point of view of getting runs on the board. Um, and I understand that they are probably be unrated originally when they're probably doing some of their work. Um, how much experience does a developer need in order to start getting ratings that are of measurable, um, on, on a measurable basis? Well, that's a really good question because I had a, an opportunity to meet with the, um, the medium density building group inside HIA a few weeks back. So uh, a couple of months back, the weeks fly away. But same sort of problem there, Peter, where um, you know, people who might have been building 20, 30, 50 houses a year suddenly said, well, I think it's time I moved into some medium density and some high rise. Well, the first thing they do is they bring that track record with them. I mean, you don't, you don't start off today and say, I'm gonna build a hundred homes a year because those days are over. The days of coming into this industry with a mobile phone and a ute, they're, they're, they're gone, they're gone. And a $2 company, they're gone. So there's always a pathway into this industry. So I would be really concerned if someone said, my first project's gonna be a $30 million, 40 apartment development. I'd go, oh, good luck with that. You know, you've got to do what you really able to do so there's pathways in that was the good conversation i had with the hia members to say now i've been doing 100 homes a year for five years now i want to move into this and say well you might know a bit about building that's good and they hire a couple of people who might be able to be experts in that space by then they've got a reasonable balance sheet they've shown a p l that they actually make a profit they don't make a loss um, that the people have been in their business five years or more you know these are the things that get you a rating so but if you think you can just come in from left field and be an overnight developer, you're dreaming. No, fair enough. I think that's uh, pretty. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing how that looks like come uh, March when the ratings uh, come out. And um, uh, I can see that you're actually building confidence in the industry. And I can see that uh, the measures and the examples that you've brought forward over the past uh, two years um, has really shaken the industry and really made people step up to uh, you know, move forward and identify issues that have been had, especially with waterproofing and wet areas. Um, and I know it's a tough, tough ask from you, especially trying to get everyone to conform to some form of system. I think go forward is important. And I think that when you look at it, and I understand you've said in the, uh, in the discussion just then that 
you're going to be dealing with the legacy stuff, the stuff that's happened in the past instead of the things that are moving forward in the future. That legacy item, I think there's going to be two different products. There's going to be a new product that is rated and there's going to be an old product that is not rated. How is that going to look for property prices in the future and what do you see there? Well, Peter, one of the problems that we've got is that out of the survey of buildings that have been built in the last six years, 25%, sorry, 30% of those buildings have serious defects in the common property. So they're either structure, waterproofing, the facade, the fire systems or the services. So there's five areas where we surveyed and we found that, I think the number was 34%, I can't recall off the top of my head, 34% of buildings had serious defects in their common property. Now we're focused on the common property because you can get lost in all of the scratches on the bench tops and all that sort of stuff. I don't think that's relevant to rebuilding confidence. That's got to do with the brand of the developer, but building confidence is to make sure that these staple pieces of buildings don't let people down. So of, of those buildings that have uh, serious defects, 25% of them, as I mentioned, were waterproofing. But what, what we're really disappointed about is that only 19% of, of those buildings reported the defects to the Office of Fair Trading. Now that's 81% didn't. Now that's 81% who were, I guess, squirreled away by their lawyers to say, oh, let's get into litigation. You know, oh, you're right, so let's, let's fight them in the courts. Well, you know, that's not the way to get these things done. But what, so what we wanna do with the legacy buildings, and we're gonna have quite a effort on legacy buildings over the next two years. And, and I've got lawyers saying to me, David, if you, if you use the RAB Act to make some of these developers fix the defects that are in these legacy buildings, that means that some of my legal cases are going to fall over. I won't have any work. And I'm saying, well, tell someone who cares. So they're saying, are you going to be interested in costs? I say, no, I'm not interested in costs. I'm interested in just getting the bloody defects fixed. So expect to see that we're going to be doing some very innovative stuff. Some of you will have seen that uh, we've introduced this thing called enforceable undertakings. I urge you, if anyone hasn't seen the draft enforceable undertakings and I'm sharing those with you so you can see but Peter what what I'm a, if you're a developer or a builder and you are intent to do the right thing and fix your defects you don't need to be taken to hell in a basket by a bloody lawyer to get there so I'm looking to try and find some middle ground in the next couple of years to clear up some of these legacy defects and take them out of the courts and stop wasting everybody's time and money Okay, I've got uh, I've got another one, uh, Commissioner. Um, the question is: Early works contractors under the DPB, the builders practitioners or nominated principal design practitioner, is to upload all documentation to achieve CC, often CC one. In your view, are the days of hiring a civil contractor to complete piling, shoring, and basement excavation now gone? Yep. Unless the early works contractor is a Class Two DPB registered building practitioner. Yep or a building practitioner engaged from day one? Yep. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yep, good. All right, so th that was a question from the floor. So thanks for that question. I think uh, one of the things today was more about the financial uh, aspects and the, um, and the activity of banks and financiers to be a part of the solution and uh, having them as part of the solution to see risk versus return, uh, making sure they can get their money, uh, and vice versa, getting OC in the in the long run in, in due course, and that's been part of the the problem. And as as well advertised, getting OC is a very important part of a developer's um, yeah, achievement because they're at peak debt. It's hurting them. Um, so uh, looking at the measures that have taken place, so some some people have had some problems in achieving OC. So um, I think I think with the good examples that you've pr proposed as well, starting to see the mentality shift. What do you see, how long do you think that there's gonna be for this transitional shift to take place and how quickly, uh, I can see you're running at a, at a hundred miles an hour, which is great. Um, I think building confidence is the key and getting consumers to trust the industry when it sort of failed back at the time um, is an important part of uh, one thing, but finance, 
and how that finance is paid and when it's paid, where do you see finance is playing even a bigger role in the future? Look, I, I think my, Michael DeCarl is a, probably a good person to talk about those sorts of areas where banks could do more. Um, and I think quantity surveyors have been screwed a bit too much in terms of doing um, reviews of developer drawdowns and those sorts of things. So look, I talk to a lot of people in the industry about, you know, where are the problems? So I also listen to the banks. I mean, the banks, the banks have been knocked around a bit by non-banks. I, I don't have a problem with non-banks at all. Um, I think secondary finance is obviously an important part of the way the market works. But there's another, there's another class of money source out there that are absolutely nothing to do with a bank. So we're using intelligence now that when I go into on, onto a project, I mean, the one I went into this morning was Commonwealth Bank. Uh, the one that I went into yesterday was another one of the known banks. Um, but the one I went into two weeks ago, it was something like XYZ0025 Proprietary Limited. Now, um, that w sends a warning bell to me because I need to see the source of funds. You all know, if you don't know, let me tell you, there are some people out there that have very questionable sources of funds. If you think I can't see those, then you're, mis you're mistaken. We just need to go and have a look on the land title and see who are the registered persons have, have an interest in the title. So all of that stuff becomes very visible to us. So I would say to you that this is a great time for banks to get back in the market, get back and support you. Doesn't matter whether they're tier one or tier two banks, not a problem. The prices are good. They're really doing good lending arrangements. They're keen to lend. They want to lend to good players. But if you're a person who's not a real bank and you're a synthetic out there hiding some other sort of agenda, we'll find you and those projects will be in strife. Okay, fair enough. Uh, well, um, I wanted to uh, just, uh, I haven't got any further questions and I just wanted to uh, thank you, Commissioner, for your valuable time in providing an informative commentary to today's important topics and relevance to finance and development. Uh, we're assured those listening today, I assume, would see the many benefits of the initiatives uh, to drive consumer confidence in this sector. And uh, we uh, thank you very much for your activity in, the, in that domain. Um, we also like to thank our registered guests for attending. And uh, one of the questions was if they could get a copy of the recording. Well, we're pleased to note that uh, uh, the commissioner and his office have, uh, we're happy to uh, receive a copy of today's presentation. Uh, we'll be sending that to you at the conclusion of this, uh, this seminar. Um, for some future events and for some noting, uh, we've got a November the 19th um, ALCC annual dinner. Uh, we'll be working closely with the New South Wales government on the restrictions applicable uh, for that to see whether that's going to continue. Um, and we're also looking forward to uh, looking forward to one of the postponed events that we had this year with uh, the famous uh, Mr. Trigoboff, uh, Harry Trigoboff, who is looking forward to seeing us all uh, hopefully in the new year uh, with an event that we'll schedule and uh, we'll keep you informed. Um, I just wanted to thank all of our registered guests. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, again uh, for attending. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all soon um, in the flesh rather than on these Zoom seminars. I think uh, that will be uh, a, a welcome relief. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And uh, very soon looking at around next month for us to be out and about, hopefully, and uh, away from these, uh, these lockdowns. So uh, thank you very much again. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. And stay safe, everybody, please. Cheers. Stay safe. Thank you very much.